how you brought that down. Yeah, I made it. Okay. What up, what up, welcome. Welcome to Scripture Social. Uh, can we pray, guys? All right, wow, this is packed. Is the AC on? Make sure you turn it down. No, you took me All right, <laughs> turn it on. Yeah, turn the AC on. Okay, good. Isn't this beautiful, though? I'm so happy that you guys all came. Uh, let's pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Just take a, just a moment of silence, and in this moment, acknowledge God's presence. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, and fill this room. Come, Holy Spirit, and fill... Fill us, Lord. Come, Holy Spirit, Lord, fill Abu Namir as he preaches the goodness of your word, that your word is a sword, that your spirit is like a sword that pierces hearts. I pray, Jesus, that hearts be pierced this, uh, this evening, that we fall in love with you, Jesus. We fall in love with your word. We fall in love with the Bible. And and how you've developed it, how you want to communicate to your people. Jesus, we love you so much. Thank you that we are together as a community. We pray your Holy Spirit come. Mary, our mother, you received the Holy Spirit perfectly. Pray for us, St. Joseph and St. George. All angels and saints be with us and intercede for us. Lord, I just pray that hearts and minds be open today to receiving the truth of God's word. We pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and the hour of our death. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Can you guys hear me? Yes. With, no? Yeah. What about now? Okay. Okay, so this semester, Father John and I were thinking about doing more apologetics, and what better way to start than the Bible? The Word of God. Or so people say, right? As Catholics, as Christians, we lay down our life based on what this one book says. It's a book like no other book, the most debated book in the history of the world. People have died for what's inside these pages. People have had major conversions, changed their lives because of a book. What is up with this book? What's in this book? So today, what I want to do, three things. So Toma, if you want to, agenda, three things. So number one, how was the Bible put together? Who came up with what books go in the Bible and which books are left out? Number two is why the Catholic Bible is different than the Protestant Bible. We get these questions a lot. It's not the same amount of books. And number three, some objections to the Word of God, to the Bible. So the word Bible comes from the word uh, Biblia, which the Greek means just books. It's a collection of books. The Bible is not one book. It's a collection of books. The Catholic Bible has how many books? And the Protestant Bible has 66. They both have the same New Testament, 27 books in the New Testament, but they differ in the Old Testament. So we'll come back to that. The process of putting the Bible together was a long one. Does anybody know when the Bible was put together? What year? Three something. Th close. Very close. Okay, so the first collection of these books that we see as the Bible today come to us from Athanasius, St. Athanasius of Alexandria in 367. And he says, let no one add anything to them or take anything from them. But he's just a bishop. We don't just 
take one bishop and whatever he says, we follow him. That's not how the Catholic Church works. We have synods, we have a council, we have a pope, right? But they had to come up with how? They had to come up with a criteria of what books to put in the canon and what books to take out or to not include. Uh, Tomas, if you want to hit that for me. So they came up with three criteria. Number one, it has to be apostolic, written by an apostle or somebody directly linked with an apostle. Number two, in the early church, they used it in liturgy. So you know how in the liturgy we read the gospel, we read the Old Testament, and then we read uh, a letter from St. Paul. So it, that, that was one of the criteria that at mass, these books were used. And number three, it has to have consistent theology. You can't have one gospel saying one thing and then another gospel saying another. And it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy to determine which books to include. For example, Eusebius, he was a historian. In the early church, the greatest historian of the time, wanted to keep out the epistle of James, 2 Peter, 2 and 3 John, Jude, and Revelation. He thought those books should not be included in the Bible. Revelation in particular was not, like it was very highly uh, contested. A lot of people did not want to have uh, Revelation in the gospel. But we also had other books. We had other books floating around at the time. So at the time, there was this movement called the Gnostic movement. And they claimed to be Christian, but they weren't. And their, their teachings were actually really crazy. So their teachings was basically that everything physical is bad and everything spiritual is good. So the God of the Old Testament was bad because he created the physical. And the God of the New Testament was good because he's trying to free us from our bodies. He's trying to free us from the physical. So what they would do, they would take the names of apostles and put it as they were the ones that wrote it. If you want to click for me. So first one, Gospel of Thomas. This is one of their writings. This is a Gnostic writing. They claim that this was from the apostle Thomas, but it's not true. So this book is a collection of sayings that Jesus supposedly said, but it contradicted the Gospels. So the early church disputed it, especially uh, Origen really fought against this one. Um, go ahead, Toma. Say it a couple more times for me. Okay, so Gospel of Judas. So the Gospel of Judas said that Judas had secret knowledge that Jesus went to him and he told him, you should betray me. And then he was the only one that supposedly Jesus taught him the gospel and he kept the gospel from the other apostles. And then number three, we have the Proto-Evangelium of James. Again, they gave this, uh, the apostle James, they said James wrote this, it was condemned. But what we can get from these books are historical facts, especially the Proto-Evangelium of James. Can anybody tell me uh, Mother Mary's parents' names. Her birthday? September 8th. How do we know this? Proto-Evangelium of James. Even though we don't believe in the teachings, but historically, he can't say Mary's parents' names without people questioning it. Because they all lived at the time. Right? He can't just make up a name. So as a historical fact, we can get some things from these books, but spiritually, no bueno. Okay, so these are the synods. So the very first time the church came together and said, these are the books that the Catholic Church is going to use. Council of Rome in 382. It was more of a synod, and then it was ratified in Hippo, Carthage, Nicaea II, Florence, and Council of Trent. Same list. Since the very beginning, the Catholic Church, we've had the same list. But this was the very first time that they put it together. Why was it ratified in 1546? Like, why does the church keep repeating itself? It's because of Martin Luther and the Protestant Reformation. So Council of Trent <clears throat> was a counter-reformation. That's what they call it. It was a council to go against what the reformers were doing. This is the Catholic Church 
This is what we believe. And they laid it all out. That was the purpose of the council. And at, at that time, obviously, Luther is trying to take books out, put books in, and he's trying to debate all these Catholic uh, dogmas that we have with Catholic teachings. And one of the big ones was purgatory. So he debated this guy named Johannes Eck. So they were debating about purgatory, and Luther is like, no, purgatory is not a real thing. I don't know why we should believe in it. This is mad. Uh, it's not in the Bible. We shouldn't believe in it. Johannes kept quoting 2 Maccabees. Because in the Mac 2 Maccabees, it says that we can pray for the dead. So what did Martin Luther do? That's not canonical. That's not part of the Bible. But how can he do that? How can he do that? So if you want to click that for me. These are the seven books that they removed. Right? Tobit, Judith, Wisdom, Sirach, Baruch, 1 and 2 Maccabees. On what base? How can he just remove books from the Bible? And he did that because of the Septuagint. So, at that time, early uh, three centuries before Jesus, Alexander the Great basically took over the whole world, right? He Hellenized the whole world. Everyone has to speak Greek. Everyone has to speak Greek. And there were Jews in exile in Alexandria, in Egypt. Now, their kids are all speaking Greek. So what they did was we need to translate the Hebrew Bible, or the Torah, right, into Greek. So they translated it, and that's what is known as the Septuagint. Roman numeral 70, because it was written by 72 elders, but they rounded down to 70. That's what the Septuagint is. So Martin Luther said, no, this is not the word of God. This was translated into Greek. It's not in Hebrew, so we're not going to claim the word of God. Even though the very first translation he made into German, the Septuagint was included. The very first King James Bible, the Septuagint were included. They moved them out later because it did not fit what they were trying to do. He also tried to take out Hebrews, James, Jude, and Revelation. He had this idea that the gospel, some of the letters, had a two-tier level. One of them was more divinely revealed than the other. And in one of his Bibles, at the end, what he ended up doing, those four books, he put them in the appendix and set up as part of the canon. But later, Protestants moved them back into, the, uh, into their Bible, but kept away those seven books. After that, we have Saint, what's his name? Saint Jerome. Saint Jerome, one of the greatest saints, brilliant man, right? Saint Jerome is famous, uh, quote is, ignorance of scripture is ignorance of Christ. So at that time, he lived in the fourth, fifth century. Rome took over. Everyone is speaking Latin now. So they need the Bible. In Latin and they said you're gonna do it St. Jerome you have to do it so he did he, he went and he translated the Bible into Latin but he didn't like it he was using the Septuagint <clears throat> he said I need to go back to Hebrew so he taught himself Hebrew and then translated it again and that Bible is called the Vulgate the Latin translation made by St. Jerome and that's the Bible that was translated into English. So every Catholic Bible that we have right now, we owe to St. Jerome, because that's the translation that every single one of us uses. And that's how we have our Bible. So now a lot of people would say, who cares, it's just a book. And I kind of want to go over through uh, some objections to the Word of God. So first objection was that it was written by Christians. So what? So what was written by Christians? If God really appeared, right? It would, you can't see somebody get healed and not be moved, right? You can't just say it as if nothing happened. It's either you're all in because you believe what happened, or you really, you can't stay lukewarm around Jesus and the stuff that he was doing. If somebody resurrected from the dead, you can't just say, oh, whatever. I don't have an opinion on it. No, you're either pro or against. Right? You can't just stay in the middle. And there were a lot of people who were pro, 
And obviously, God touched them, and they were inspired by the Holy Spirit, and they put everything down. But we also have a lot of outside sources, a lot of outside non-Christian sources that spoke about this man named Jesus. They spoke about these crazy Christians that are running around proclaiming that this man resurrected. Uh, so Thomas, you want to hit a couple of signs for me? None of these guys are Christian. All in the early church, and this is what they wrote. Right? Jesus, a real man, called the Christ, caused Jewish disturbance. Allegedly born of a virgin, father a carpenter, had miraculous power. They're not believers. This is in their writing. Right? Wise man, his followers reported resurrection. Executed the day before the Passover had magical power. The Talmud is a, it's like a commentary on the Torah. It's a very big deal in Jewish. In, um, Judaism. Jesus lived. Jesus was crucified, darkness and earthquake. Called the Christ. Followers Christians exe executed under uh, Pontius Pilate. These are non-Christians. So that, that whole argument goes out of the way. It was only written by Christians. Like, no, it wasn't. Jesus was a real man. Whether you believed and you wrote the Gospels or you didn't, you didn't believe, but you still recognize that he was alive. You still recognize that some people said they saw him, that he had followers, that there was darkness on earth when he passed away. You can't encounter Jesus and stay put. Like, you, we just can't do it. Second objection. We don't have the original copies. So that's what they claim. If we don't have the original copies, so many different translations... Every, like the, everything could be lost, right? The word could be lost, it could be mistranslated. So scholars say, and there have been some little differences, right? Differences in the Bible. 75% of them are just spelling mistakes, right? 15% of them are other Greek synonyms that does not affect the meaning. Same meaning, they use a different example, right? 9% do affect the meaning, but they are from a later document. So you can always go back to an earlier one and correct it and find what the meaning truly was. And then 1%, it does affect the meaning, but it does not change doctrine. It does not change what we believe in. But here's the thing. Why do we do this only with the Bible? With the Bible, we have to go so deep. Did anybody in here question whether Aristotle lived or not? What about Julius Caesar? Was he a historical man? Did he live? How come we don't question how many writings we have about them? You want to hit that for me? Uh, Julius Caesar's, we have 10 manuscripts. Aristotle, 49. Homer, this is mostly the Iliad, 649. Over 5,000 manuscripts about Jesus. How are we still questioning? Why is this the only book that we put under a microscope and not all these other ones? I guarantee you, you've never met a guy that said Aristotle didn't live. You've never heard that in your life. How many people claim that Jesus was not a real man? That Jesus never existed? And look how much more proof we have. Um, Thomas, if you want to. Okay, Dead Sea Scrolls. Have you got anybody here heard, uh, heard about the Dead Sea Scrolls? We got the best find ever. In 1947, these six were playing by the Dead Sea, which is like 13 miles east of Jerusalem, according to Google. I don't know, I looked it up today. So <laughs> that's where they were playing, and then they were just hitting, throwing some rocks in a cave, and something broke. And they went in there and they found these, these writings, these manuscripts. These manuscripts that were there, written in Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. And scholars believe that they were written by this sect of Jews called the Essenes. So these guys did not want to live in the city. They did not want to sin. They were very radical in a good way. They wanted to live under the law, so they lived in caves. They lived very extreme lives. There's somebody in the Bible that some people claim wasn't a scene. Can anybody guess who it is? 
St. John the Baptist. St. John the Baptist lived off honey and wild locusts. That's a radical life. So they believe they were the guys that wrote these manuscripts, right? But why are they so important? Because for one, they're the Bible, right? They had all the Old Testament writings. The ones that everyone disputes, they had writings from the Septuagint that people don't claim to be the word of God. And they had the writings of Isaiah complete, the book of Isaiah complete. So prior to these findings, the oldest version of Isaiah we had was from the year 800 AD. Dead Sea Scrolls dated back to 200 BC, almost a thousand years prior. But you know, if you make copies, you're gonna lose the meaning, right? You're gonna lose what was written. It was exactly the same, exactly the same. The book of Isaiah was exactly the same. Were there minor changes? Sure, but it was the same book. Okay, um, the next thing we have is church fathers. So church fathers, the early church was Catholic. If you read their writings, and they're actually really cool, you should look them up. They're Catholic. They believe everything we believe in right now. And what they did, almost every other sentence, they're quoting scripture. Almost every other one, right? Hundreds of thousands of quotations of what scripture was. These are just some of their writings. Some church fathers, look at how many citations of scripture in them. There was this guy named Bart Ehrman. He's a very famous New, uh, New Testament scholar who's actually no longer a Christian. He's, a, he's an atheist. This is what he said about the church fathers. So extensive are these citations that if all other sources of our knowledge of the text of the New Testament were destroyed, they would be sufficient alone for the reconstruction of practically the whole New Testament. If we lost the Bible, but only had the writings of the church fathers, we can put together the New Testament. And it all matches. It all matches. And these guys, a lot of them, were not, were not neighbors, right? They were not living next to each other. Um, can you hit that for me? I found this cool map. Remember, the Bible was put together in 386, right? Look at all these guys, different parts of the world, writing, quoting the same scripture. There's no phone, no email, no Twitter, all saying the same stuff. This is the power of the Holy Spirit, that the word of God will not be denied. This is basically the whole known world. And look how far these guys are from, look how different continents. They're all saying the same thing. Because no one can touch the word of God. This is how God chose to speak to his people. And it's not gonna be tainted. My favorite, I'll tell you when to click it. My favorite um, kind of apologetic thing for the scripture is undesigned coincidences. I actually just came across this. I started reading this book. It is really, really, really cool. Hitting in Plain View by Lydia McGrew. It actually rhymed, but this is a good book. Um, so what is undesigned coincidences? So it's multiple uh, sources talking about a story, but there are small details in these stories that we're really not part of that story being told, but it kind of ties in the other story in a different gospel. This will make sense through example. So the first one, John 6. This is Jesus feeding the 5,000, right? He says, <coughs> when Jesus raised his eyes and saw that a large crowd was coming to him, he said to Philip, where can we buy enough food for them to eat? First question is, why are you asking Philip? Philip is a very minor character in the Bible. The first person we should be asking is Judas. He held the money bag. Or maybe Peter. He's the head, he's the main guy. He takes care of everybody. He takes care of everything. Why are we asking Philip? 
John 12, completely different place. It says, now there were some Greeks among those who had come up to worship at the feast. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, sir, we would like to see you. Again, this is just like an add-on little detail that does not matter in this story. Right? And then you look at a different gospel, Luke 9. This is Luke's version of uh, feeding the 5,000. When the apostles returned, they explained to him what they had done. He took them and withdrew them in private to a town called Bethsaida. It's interconnected. It's all in it. Like this small detail does not really matter. Jesus just wanted to go pray. Right? They're in, Beth in Bethsaida here. It doesn't matter. What's in Bethsaida? That's where Philip is from. And now it makes sense why he would ask him. Because it's his people. It's his city. He knows everyone there. He knows where, this, where the market is to go get the food. Small detail that does not even matter in the story. Undesigned coincidences. This is how we can tell the Gospels have the truth. I have one more example here. Matthew 14, 1. At that time, Herod heard the reputation of Jesus and said to his servant, this man is John the Baptist. He has been raised from the dead. That is why mighty powers are at work with him. First question you want to ask yourself. Herod is the ruler of the whole place. Why is he asking his servants? Why is he talking to his servant? It doesn't make sense. Why is the king, right, basically the, the main guy is talking about Jesus to his servant? And not only that, how does Matthew know what he's doing in his house sure with a servant? Siri doesn't even know. <laughs> no one knows. <laughs> right? Click both of them. We see this in Luke. Different gospel. Guys, different gospel. Afterwards, he journeyed from one town and village to another, preaching and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. Who was with him? Accompanying him were the twelve and some women who had been cure, cured of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary called the Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out. Joanna, the wife of Herod's steward, Chusa. That's how he knew. Because that servant's wife was one of the disciples that walked with Jesus. She was one of the women that followed Jesus. This is how Matthew would know. Look how small this line is in this story. He spoke to his servants. I read this gospel maybe two weeks ago. I mean, that's the last thing I thought of, that line. He spoke to his servants. Who cares? He spoke to his servants. But if you really look at it, you see how it's all interconnected. It all fits. And this book is full of examples. I just started it. It's honestly been so great. Uh, full of examples of how the gospel is all interconnected. It did happen. They were there. And these, these undesigned coincidences is how we know. The word of God. Why is it important? Why is the word of God important? See, a lot of times we say, oh, just read the Bible. Why read your Bible? What is the point? Is it a moral book? Is it a story book? Is it a history book? What kind of book is it? Why read your Bible? What do we do when we pray, guys? We have a conversation with who? We talk to God. You know how God decided to speak to you? The Bible. In prayer, we speak to God. In reading the Bible, we allow God to speak to us. It is the greatest gift that we have received. That's why so many people died for this book. That's why so many people gave up their lives for this book. That's why so many people change their lives for this book. Because they're not words. They're God's words that will pierce your heart 
to tell you that you are loved. Amen? Amen. You guys do Q&A? I don't know how this works. Is there a Q&A or I guess any questions? No? All right. I mean, God bless you guys. Thank you for coming. And in two weeks, Father John is going to have a fire talk for you guys. And have a great night. Thank you, brother. Guys, I'm really sorry. So this is how you know I'm new at this. We do have small groups somewhere here and there and one upstairs in the church. So one here, one there, and one in the church. Okay,